welcome to a new episode of Pick 6 Movies. Let me start by saying, Domo Erigato. No, I'm not just thanking you, although we definitely appreciate you being here. But our season 26 is a set of movies hardwired to entertain you with tales of robots and robot-adjacent tomfoolery. A season we are calling Domo Arigato. As with every episode, not only do you get me, that's Bo Ranstell, and my best pal, Chad Cooper, opening up the metal housing to see what makes these automatons tick, you get an introduction to give you some backstory on the movie and some interesting tidbits to make you look smarter at parties. And we do that six times every ding-dong season. We are kicking off this season with a tale of disgusting robot love and dead beep dads with the Andy Kaufman, Bernadette Peters misfire, Heartbeeps from 1981. But enough of my yammering, let's turn on the servos and march this unholy metallic beast of a show into your ears. Take it away, Chad. In May of 1897, American satirist Samuel Clemens, a.k.a. Mark Twain, was traveling in London on a speaking tour to earn some cash to pay off sizable debts he had related to some unsuccessful investments. While in London, a rumor began that Mark Twain was gravely ill. This rumor evolved to the point where Mark Twain had died on his speaking tour. Now, there is a legend that a major American newspaper printed Twain's obituary to which he responded, the reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. Sometimes you hear the quote that the reports of his death are grossly exaggerated, but both of these are inaccurate. It never happened. Here's what's a little bit closer to the truth. In May of 1897, Frank Marshall White, an English correspondent for the New York Journal, reached out to Twain while he was in London to ask about Twain's poor health. The editors of the New York Journal sent a cable message to White requesting a quote from Twain as he was reportedly on his deathbed. Twain was both amused and annoyed by the report, portraying him as being on his deathbed and in poverty while in London. Twain responded in a handwritten letter, I can understand perfectly how the report of my illness got about. I have even heard on good authority that I was dead. James Ross Clemens, a cousin of mine, was seriously ill two or three weeks ago in London, but as well now. The report of my illness grew out of his illness. The report of my death was an exaggeration. The misquote of what Twain said is attributed to a biography that was published in 1912, two years after Twain died. The biography includes the source of the misquote where the author of this biography embellishes the story a little bit. The author states that the reporter, White, was told to send back a 500-word story if Twain was ill and a 1,000-word story if Twain was dead. In this version of the story, White showed the request to Twain, who smiled grimly and said, you don't need as much as that. Just say the report of my death has been grossly exaggerated. Twain himself wrote in his 1897 book, Following the Equator, that, quote, I believe that nearly any invented quotation played with confidence stands a good chance to deceive. And Twain was right. If you make something up and you play it straight, many people will believe it without any evidence to back it up. Although Twain never actually read his obituary, he wasn't the only famous person to ever fall victim to what is known as a death hoax. Following the death of Franklin Roosevelt, there were death hoax reports of multiple celebrities being dead, including Charlie Chaplin and Frank Sinatra. In 1966, rumors across college campuses began to spread that Paul McCartney was killed in a car crash and that he was replaced with a lookalike to spare fans from unimaginable grief. In September of 1969, the student newspaper of Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa, published an article titled, Is Beatle Paul McCartney Dead? The article cited some clues from recent Beatles albums, including a hidden message when one played the song Revolution 9 from the White Album backward. Reportedly, you could hear the words, Turn me on, dead man. The article also cited evidence from the back cover of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, where John, George, and Ringo are facing forward, but Paul is turned backward. <laughs> oh, people do crazy stuff when they're high. Reportedly, this was the first time that someone had published a Paul is Dead theory, but it wasn't the last. This was the age of Vietnam, and there was growing distrust in establishments, including government and the media. People were susceptible to believing all kinds of crazy conspiracy theories. <laughs> oh, thank goodness it's not like that anymore, he said, trying not to sigh heavily. 
The rumors of Paul McCartney's death were only fueled when their album Abbey Road was released, where the album cover featured the famous image of the four members in the crosswalk, with Paul barefoot representing he was the corpse. John Lennon was in a white suit representing the priest. Despite multiple denials of Paul McCartney's death, including a denial by Paul McCartney himself, it didn't put an end to this rumor. McCartney told the BBC, quote, If the conclusion you reach is that I'm dead, then you're wrong, because I'm alive and living in Scotland, end quote. <laughs> Just the thing a fake Paul McCartney would say. <laughs> but Sir Paul McCartney wasn't alone. Sir Sean Connery ultimately had to appear on The Late Show with David Letterman in 1993 to prove that he wasn't dead. A rumor began when a close friend of Connery's died around the same time that Texas Governor John Connolly died. And this all got jumbled up in a Japanese newspaper report leading to rumors that the James Bond actor was dead when he was not. With the birth of social media, other celebrities fell victim to hearing that they died through internet reports, including but not limited to Tom Cruise, Matt Damon, Gene Hackman, George Clooney, Beyonce, Hilary Duff, Jackie Chan, Morgan Freeman, Steven Seagal, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. <gasps> Now there's a flip side to the celebrity death hoax, which comes in the form of a death denial conspiracy theory. This is when someone, usually a famous person, dies, but the rumor is they're still alive. Most famously was the death of Elvis Presley in 1977. Elvis died sitting on the toilet, straining really hard to take a shit. That's a fact. Reportedly, Elvis was a longtime user of opiates, which causes severe constipation. His use of other drugs combined with other health issues was a perfect combination leading to the king of rock and roll dying on the throne from a heart attack. By the early 1980s, there began to be rumored sightings of Elvis, starting with a sighting of a man who looked like Elvis in the Memphis airport claiming to be John Burroughs, a name Elvis used when checking into hotels. Subsequent sightings in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and at California's Legoland led publications like the Weekly World News to regularly feature Elvis Presley on the cover, promoting the idea that Elvis may still be alive. And for people checking out at grocery stores across the country, it really kept this idea alive that Elvis, well, may be alive. Actor Bill Bixby, who starred with Elvis in two movies, hosted two, count them, two documentary specials investigating the conspiracy theories of Elvis still being alive. There was The Elvis Files in 1991, and one year later, The Elvis Conspiracy in 1992. Now, about this time, there were rumors that Elvis actually made a cameo in the movie Home Alone, one of the highest grossing movies of all time. <laughs> yeah, that's how you keep a low profile after you fake your death. Rumors of Elvis working with the mob or maybe with the government as a double agent began to bubble up. There was a movie titled Bubba Hotep starring Bruce Campbell and Ozzie Davis, which you should see if you have not. It's all centered about Elvis faking his death and swapping places with a lookalike only to do battle with an Egyptian mummy in a nursing home alongside an elderly John F. Kennedy, who also also is not dead, but is now an elderly black man confined to a wheelchair. Trust me, it's even better than it sounds. And speaking of JFK, this phenomena of people spreading rumors about people being alive after they're dead included JFK Jr., who reportedly survived his 1999 plane crash. And according to the QAnon movement, he's going to return to be Donald Trump's vice president in 2024. What a world we live in. Tupac Shakur, Prince, Michael Jackson, they were all the focus of similar conspiracy theories that plagued Elvis Presley, where they faked their death but were secretly alive. For many, these rumors are grounded in the hope that these entertainers would return to continue to make music for their most loyal fans or allegedly molest more children. But there was one celebrity who died, and upon his death, the rumors of him faking his demise were not started by his fans. They were actually started by those closest to him who knew him better than anybody else. Which, by most reports, nobody really knew him at all. Andrew Jeffrey Kaufman was born on January 17, 1949, but everybody knew him as Andy. Kaufman was a entertainer? Like, performance artist? I People regularly mislabeled him as a comedian, but Kaufman didn't tell jokes or partake in comedy as it was defined at the time. In an interview, Kaufman told a reporter, quote, The comedian's promise is that he will go out there and make you laugh with him. My only promise is that I will try to entertain you as best as I can, end quote. And that's perhaps the best word to describe Andy Kaufman. He was an entertainer, and at times he had an audience of one, himself. 
Kaufman grew up in New York, and at an early age, he found a love of entertaining others. He would perform at birthday parties as a child, overcoming early shy tendencies. After struggling through school, Kaufman eventually graduated high school and received a permanent 4F deferment to avoid being drafted into the Vietnam War following a psychological evaluation that he failed. The doctor who evaluated Kaufman said that he lived in a fantasy world that he had created as a child, and if he was put into the military, he would lose his mind. Kaufman proudly showed off the letter containing this report to his friends. Kaufman knew what he was doing and encouraged people regularly to believe whatever they wanted to believe. Kaufman began working in comedy clubs in the 1970s, where he caught the eye of Bud Friedman, who owned the Improv Comedy Club. Friedman took a chance on Kaufman. Now, his act was a bit unconventional. So, for example, Kaufman would come out on stage and set up a record player and play a recording of the Mighty Mouse cartoon theme song, where he would lip sync the only line, Here I come to save the day. It was odd. Other times, Kaufman performed on stage as his foreign man character. It was a persona that he created as a child to entertain his sister. He would speak in a slightly high-pitched, choppy accent, and he would do impressions of famous people, but would maintain the voice and mannerisms of the foreign man persona. As audiences grew frustrated or accustomed to his inability to impersonate people, Kaufman would announce his final impression, Elvis Presley, where he would perform a pitch perfect impression of Elvis Presley, driving the audience wild, only to return to his foreign man accent at the end. Kaufman's performances at comedy clubs in New York City ultimately landed him a guest spot on the first season of Saturday Night Live. In his performance, Kaufman performed as his foreign man character, and he comes out on stage and begins to butcher a story that has no real punchline. It was three people and they carried the biggest cannon in the world to Spain. So it was two boys and one girl, and they carrying the, the cannon uh, to the highest mountain in Spain. So the first boy, you know, they, they are on top of the mountain, and the first boy, he point the cannon to this castle and so 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 he so he he said to the second boy all right hand me the cannonball and so 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 the second boy he say uh, I thought you had them. <laughs> so so wait listen so 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 the so listen so so they both Turn to the girl, and she say, "Don't look at me." <laughs> you know, because uh, they could not shoot. <laughs> they are, they have the cannon, but they they could not. They have no cannonball. They could not shoot. <laughs> Do you understand? As the audience awkwardly laughs, an imitation of Archie Bunker followed. This that was anything but an accurate imitation. You stop it. You. You are so stupid. Everybody stupid. Uh, get get out of my chair, meathead. You go in the, the thing that get into the kitchen making the food. Uh, every everybody is stupid. I don't like nobody is so stupid. This led into an uncomfortable silence as he forgot his next bit. Now I would like to imitate uh, The audience sits in silence with moments of uncomfortable laughter. The moments grow so uncomfortable that Kaufman addresses his audience, who is unsure what is happening on live TV. I, I think we should turn off the TV. <laughs> I don't know if, if you are laughing at me or with me. <laughs> but, you know, uh, you know, I'm trying to do my best. And uh, I forgot what I was going to do, but, but... 
I promise that, uh, you know, it's nothing I can do, but promise I will not be here again. <laughs> <laughs> but he's so funny about that. that. I don't... He grows so despondent that he begins to cry. I don't know what to do. turns into a rhythmic chant, leading Kaufman to play a conga drum that has been sitting on stage the whole time, in rhythm with his cry chant. And he immediately wins back the audience as they clap along and he dances off the stage. People didn't know what to make of this, but they wanted more. This was at a time when there was all kinds of weird shit showing up on TV. Waylon Flowers and his sassy old broad puppet Madam would show up to spew sexy double entendres. Mime duo Shields and Yarnell would pretend to be robots on multiple variety shows. Fun fact, Yarnell was Dot Matrix in Spaceballs, with Joan Rivers only doing the voiceover work. Swiss mask theater troupe Moomenshots They'd show up to pull toilet paper off their heads, and they were oftentimes featured on The Muppet Show, which had its own flavor of absolutely adorable and lovable oddities that were injected into pop culture. Kaufman's flavor of entertainment was ill-defined and different. It was just the kind of thing that some people were looking for. And some of those people were TV producers who approached Kaufman to take his foreign man character and adapt him for the sitcom Taxi, where he would play the mechanic Lodka. Bob Zamuda, Kaufman's longtime friend and writing partner, said that the show creators of Taxi essentially bought Kaufman's foreign man character to turn into Lodka. Kaufman was encouraged to take the job by his managers, and Kaufman agreed to appear in 14 episodes per season, but he wanted four of these appearances to feature his alter ego, Tony Clifton. Tony Clifton was an abrasive Catskill-style comedian who took pleasure in making the audience hate him. This request was removed from Kaufman's contract after Kaufman deliberately appeared as Clifton on the set of Taxi, offending everyone and ultimately sabotaging any chance of Tony Clifton ever appearing on that show ever. Tony Clifton would open for Andy Kaufman at comedy clubs, sometimes being portrayed by his friend Bob Zamuda or his brother Michael. Audiences would show up to sometimes see Tony Clifton perform, expecting it to be Kaufman dressed up as the character, only to have Kaufman appear on stage at the end of Clifton's performance, revealing to the audience that they had been duped and that they saw a fake performance of Tony Clifton, all to the delight of Andy Kaufman. Kaufman's deal with ABC to appear in the sitcom Taxi provided him with a television special. In this special, he decided that he wanted to interview Howdy Doody the Puppet. He included a section titled Has Been Corner. At one point in the special, he intentionally aired static so that viewers at home would think their TVs were not working correctly. Kaufman appeared on the late night sketch show Fridays, a competitor to Saturday Night Live that aired, you know, on Fridays. In the final sketch of his first appearance, he broke character and just stopped reading the lines from his cue cards and said he felt stupid in the sketch. Fellow performer Michael Richards, who would go on to play Kramer on the sitcom Seinfeld, walked off camera, grabbed the cue cards, brought them back on stage, and threw them in front of Andy. Kaufman, in response, threw a glass of water at Richards, which ultimately led to Kaufman getting into a fight with a crew member on live TV before they cut away to a commercial. The fight, it turns out, was planned all along. Kaufman made multiple appearances on the talk show circuit, including The Tonight Show, and most famously on Late Night with David Letterman. Kaufman became obsessed with the world of professional wrestling, entertainment that is both fake and real, all at the same time. Kaufman wrestled Jerry the King Lawler after taunting him with multiple videos that also insulted his fans and residents of more rural areas. Their feud contained and included Kaufman suffering a neck injury from a pile driver wrestling move done by Lawler. The two appeared on the David Letterman talk show together where Lawler hit Kaufman in the face, knocking him out of his chair. It turns out that all of this was staged but was not revealed till over 10 years later. Kaufman appeared in a film titled My Breakfast with Blassie, 
where he ate at a Sambo's restaurant, oh my god, with wrestling personality Classy Freddy Blassie. The film was a parody of the film My Dinner with Andre. Now, in the movie, Bob Zamuda appears as an admiring fan, which leads to a fight in the restaurant. My Dinner with Andre was directed by Johnny Legend, and his sister, Lynn Margulies, also appears in the movie. Margulies would later become the filmmaker behind the documentary-style film I'm From Hollywood, a movie that chronicles Andy Kaufman's exploits in the world of professional wrestling. Margulies and Kaufman were romantically involved, and she would be with him until his death. But let's put a pin in that for just a moment. Andy Kaufman only acted in three films. Kaufman had a small part as a police officer in 1976, God Told Me To, a sci-fi horror film about seemingly normal people just killing other people and then claiming, as the title gives away, God told me to do it. In 1980, Kaufman appeared in the movie In God We Trust. Hmm, two movies featuring God in the title, that's odd. The, <laughs> the, the movie was directed by, produced by, and starred Marty Feldman, who you may remember as Igor from Young Frankenstein, among other films. In this film, Kaufman played a television evangelist named Armageddon T. Thunderbird. In that same film, Richard Pryor played a character named G.O.D., a supercomputer. Peter Boyle was a con artist, Louise Lasser was a hooker named Mary, and Feldman was a naive monk. If you've never heard of this film, it's because it's not very good. And Kaufman's third and final movie is the subject of this episode, Heartbeeps. Heartbeeps was released in 1981, and it's a sci-fi rom-com about two robots who fall in love. Andy Kaufman starred as the movie's male lead, a robot named Val, and his co-star was Bernadette Peters, a female robot named Aqua. Normally, this is when we talk about how and why the movie got made, and then towards the end, we'll throw in a few reviews of the movie. But we're going to do things a little bit differently this time. See, Heartbeeps has a 0% freshness rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Vincent Canby from the New York Times described the movie as unbearable and felt the story was dreadful. Reviewer Gary Arnold said that he didn't imagine that the film stars would suffer too much because nobody was going to see this movie. Siskel and Ebert both gave it two big thumbs down. And even Andy Kaufman himself thought that the movie was so bad that, well, here's what he had to say. When I made that movie Heartbeeps. And I, it got terrible reviews, and I rightfully saw it was a terrible movie. And I'm embarrassed, I'm embarrassed that I was in it. And I, and I just want to say about that is that I did not write it, direct it, produce it. I had nothing to do with it. I was hired to act in it, and because my name was up there, people think it was, oh, my movie. Well, I just want to say to, the, to my fans, if there are any out there, that, that uh, I would like to personally apologize to each and every one of you for me being in that movie. And I mean... The, the people, now, the people who worked with me in the movie, the director, producer, the writer, they were all very wonderful people. It just didn't come out right. The movie just did not come out right. And, and uh, I want to apologize to all of you who saw my name and you went there because you wanted to see me in a movie and you were very disappointed. And it's the truth of the matter is I am right now working with my lawyer on a plan. I would love to be able to personally give back the money that all of you paid <laughs> for your admission price. And I am right now working on a plan where I can legally do that out of my pocket refund everybody's admission price back. Well, make, make sure you have change for a 20. <laughs> so, the, <laughs> so the movie's terrible. Now, that's not unusual. There are a lot of bad movies out there, but this one had a lot of good people working on it. The musical score was composed by John Williams. Yeah, that John Williams. Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Superman, Jurassic Park, Harry Potter, Jaws, Close Encounters, Home Alone, that John Williams. The film was directed by Alan Arkish, a collaborator of Joe Dante. You know Joe Dante, the guy who directed Gremlins and Piranha and Inner Space? After this heartbeeps disaster, the film's director, Arkish, he went on to do a lot of work in television, directing the famous Dancing Baby episode of Ally McBeal. Good for him. As terrible as this movie is, it did receive an Oscar nomination for special effects makeup thanks to Stan Winston. Yeah, that's Stan Winston. Terminator 2, Aliens, Jurassic Park, that's Stan Winston. Now, for the record, Heartbeeps lost the Oscar for best makeup in 1982 to Rick Baker's work for An American Werewolf in London. <laughs> The movie was written by John Hill, who had limited writing experience and would later go on to write a few episodes for the TV show Quantum Leap and L.A. Law, among others. As for the cast, the movie also features weirdo extraordinaire Randy Quaid. You can hear all about his life 
on our episode about Christmas Vacation 2, Cousin Eddie's Island Adventure, if you're interested. It's a bonus episode at the end of Season 4. SNL alumnist Christopher Guest, who's also married to Jamie Lee Curtis, is in this movie. Melanie Mayron plays Susan. She would later find success as Melissa Stedman on the 1980 show 30-something. Christopher Guest and Melanie Marin, they play a young couple who live in a trash pile, as best as I can tell from watching this thing. A little bit more on that later. Legendary guitar frontman Jerry Garcia lent his guitar talent to provide sound effects for the robot Phil. Legendary comedian Jack Carter, who we last saw on Pick 6 Movies getting eaten by an alligator in the movie Alligator, Season 16, Episode 2. That was a good one. Well, that Jack Carter, he voices the character of Catskill, the wise, cracking, and unfunny robot. So we have all these talented people in this movie, but it's an absolute dumpster fire. How did this happen? Now, reportedly, the top brass at Universal Studios came in and said, bah, 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 bah. Oh, sons of bitches over 20th Century Fox, they think they're the only ones who can make a movie about talking robots and all kinds of electronic doodads. Boys, here's a blank check. Go make a hit movie with gizmos and doodads from the future that we can put on t-shirts and lunchboxes and Halloween masks and make little dolls and bullshit with ridiculously high margins. Who wants to get rich, boys? Who wants to get rich? <laughs> Sure, Star Wars was a huge success, and people, mostly kids, they really liked R2-D2 and C-3PO in that movie, among other things. Attaching Andy Kaufman to the project gave the movie a little extra energy. Kaufman agreed to the project for one reason and one reason alone. He wanted to make a Tony Clifton movie that he wrote with partner Bob Zamuda. Studios weren't sure that Kaufman and his alter ego were strong enough to carry a feature film. Sure, playing the lovable mechanic on a TV sitcom was one thing, but being a leading man in a movie was another. Heart Beeps comes out and it tanks miserably. So the Tony Clifton movie was destined to never be. Now in that film, it was gonna be a biographic story of Tony Clifton's life, where at the end, Tony Clifton dies of cancer at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. Two years after the release of Heartbeeps in 1983, Andy Kaufman went in for a series of tests at Cedar sinai Medical Center, where he was diagnosed with large cell carcinoma of the lung. Kaufman initially treated his illness with natural medicines and a diet of fruits and vegetables, but when he finally opted for radiotherapy, the cancer had spread from his lungs to his brain. Kaufman appeared at the premiere of My Breakfast with Blassie in 1984 with a mohawk to help offset the effects of his radiation treatments. Then on May 16, 1984, Andy Kaufman died at the age of 35. Or did he? When Andy Kaufman announced that he had cancer, friends and family close to him were suspicious that this might be another piece of performance art, another show where Andy was the intended audience, watching the reactions of others for his own entertainment. Kaufman regularly discussed faking his death as one of the greatest hoaxes he could ever pull off. Bob Zmuda said in 1982 that Kaufman called him around four in the morning telling him he had decided to fake his death and insisting that Bob come meet him right away. Zmuda met Kaufman, reportedly Zmuda met Kaufman at Cantor's Deli in Los Angeles, where Kaufman laid out his plan, and Zmuda told him that what he was wanting to do was illegal, and Zmuda refused to have any part of it. Zmuda claims that Kaufman told him 30 years was the time frame for this hoax, and that Lynn Margulies, the woman Zmuda identified as the love of Andy's life, would not be involved in this. In Zmuda's account of this plan, Kaufman found someone who resembled him who was in fact dying of cancer. And over time, Kaufman lost weight and shaved his head to resemble this body double. When the other person died, a switch was made with the double and that person was buried as Kaufman and Kaufman was spirited away to go start a new life. But this story actually may be a hoax perpetrated by Bob Zamuda. He was, after all, Kaufman's accomplice in so many of these elaborate schemes. Andy Kaufman's early death and eccentric legacy of entertainment combined with the rumors that he might still be alive elevated him as an entertainment and comedy icon. Tony Clifton continued to perform at the Comedy Store after Kaufman's death. Many suspected it was always Bob Zamuda dressed up in the famed insult comic outfit. Over the years since his death, rumors of Andy Kaufman's return began to increase, especially as the 30-year anniversary of his death grew closer. 
In 2013, at the Andy Kaufman Awards, a ceremony held annually at the Gotham Comedy Club, Michael Kaufman, Andy's brother, took the stage and introduced a woman claiming to be Andy's adult daughter. Michael Kaufman stated that years earlier, he found an essay written by Andy, which included how Andy would fake his death. In the essay, there were instructions for Michael to meet Andy at a restaurant on Christmas Eve in 1999. Michael did so, and a man he did not know approached and handed him a typed letter. This letter, allegedly from Andy Kaufman, was read by Michael in front of the crowd at the Gotham Comedy Club. In it, Andy claimed that everything was great in his life and he just wanted to get away from being Andy Kaufman. The letter stated that Kaufman had fallen in love and now had a daughter who was 24 years old. At this point, a woman appeared on stage being introduced as McCoy, a name that Kaufman used when checking into hospitals. Ed Cavanaugh, showroom manager of the Gotham Comedy Club said, you could see by the look on Michael's face that it had an emotional impact on him. When asked whether or not Kavanaugh believed the woman's story about being Andy's daughter, Kavanaugh said, I don't know whether somebody is perpetrating something on Michael or not. I'm truly 50-50 on this one. Al Paranello, a lifelong friend of Kaufman, who also produces the awards ceremony, he was convinced of the story's veracity, even though he was one of the few people who attended Kaufman's funeral and actually saw his body, because the funeral had a closed casket with only family and close friends seeing Kaufman's body. However, the 30th anniversary of his death came and went, and Andy Kaufman did not return. Is Andy Kaufman dead or alive? <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine. Andy Kaufman was slash is an entertainer who intentionally blurred the lines between reality and fiction. He had a passion for making the audience love him only to confuse them and then anger them and surprise them with a finale where people would leap to their feet in applause as they realized this was all an elaborate emotional ride with Andy Kaufman leading them every step of the way. Shortly after Michael Kaufman's presentation at the Gotham Comedy Club with Andy's alleged adult daughter, Michael Kaufman appeared on the cable news channel CNN with anchor Jake Tapper, where it was revealed that it was impossible to reach Kaufman's daughter and that he now believed he was victim of an elaborate hoax. But what about Heartbeats? The final film featuring Andy Kaufman, not as himself. Is it any good? We know the answer to that question from earlier. Of course, it's not any good. Andy Kaufman was going to refund everybody's money who went to see this thing. But you know what? We need to get Mr. Bo Ransdell in here to discuss this movie from start to finish to see what exactly makes this movie so refund worthy. Ladies and gentlemen, Aquas and Vows, it's 1981's long forgotten for <laughs> multiple reasons. <laughs> Heartbeats. Thank you very much. <laughs>